Good morning, everyone. So glad you've come. Um, Tiffany, for those who are just arriving, Tiffany's there at the conference in room six. You're welcome to join her. The rest of us are along the, the West Coast, LA and um, Washington. And we're here to chat about permanent supportive housing and how to do it well, especially for domestic violence survivors. Um, and I'm excited for you to meet our panel today, with starting with Chris. Thanks, Amy, and good morning, everyone. So glad that you're here. Um, I'm Chris Billhart. I use she, her pronouns, and I work with um, the Safe Housing Alliance, formerly known as NASH. Um, I'm the Director of Program and Practice Innovation with NASH, and we provide technical assistance and consultation to um, communities that are working at the intersection of domestic and sexual violence and homelessness. And what brought me to this work was uh, the fact that this field that, that we're in, um, it, it allows me to work on so many different social justice issues all at once because there are so many intersections that addressing violence um, also address. So I am happy to be here with you and I'm gonna hand it off to Tiffany. Tiffany, I think your screen might be frozen. Not sure if going off video might help. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, we could hear you say that, but nothing else. Try again. Saba, do you want to introduce yourself? Well, Tiffany sorts things. I can go ahead while our, our tech gets worked out. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Saba Mwine. I am the Managing Director of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. And it is my pleasure to be with you here today. Um, HPRI is a collaborative of researchers, policymakers, service providers, and people with lived experience of homelessness, all working to accelerate equitable and culturally informed solutions to homelessness in LA County and uh, extensively beyond. Uh, so uh, what brings me to this, to this work, uh, I think, firstly, are my own intersectional identities of being a black woman um, and uh, sort of a deep recognition of, the, of what that feels like in my own body and how that intersects with systems. Um, and prior to the work uh, in homelessness, I was in fair housing. Uh, so uh, coming with a real deep understanding of the issue of access to housing based on race and how that manifests in, in affordable housing and in, in our solutions as we look toward understanding race as a root cause of homelessness in our nation. So um, with that, I will pass it to Tiffany. Tiffany, I'm not sure if, if um, I see that your camera's off uh, and that it's still, it's muted for you. Okay, I think I think we might have some internet issues. So yeah. Tiffany's um, signed off and we'll sign back in. And I guess in the meantime, maybe we can, uh, I'll pass it to Amy. Yeah. Um, good morning again. I'm Amy Turk. I have the privilege of overseeing the Downtown Women's Center located in the, our physical offices are located in the Skid Row community of Los Angeles. Uh, we've been providing services, full continuum of services for women experiencing homelessness since the late 1970s. I, I came to this work with a desire to be a part of a helping profession. I volunteered in a shelter that I then ultimately directed um, when I was in college. And for 20 years now, I've worked in close proximity serving um, primarily women through their journeys from homelessness into permanent housing. 
And now I think we've got Stephanie on for introductions. Can we hear you now? <laughs> Almost. Let me kind of share where we're going in this conversation. And <laughs> do we got you? No. Okay. So can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, you can hear me. Yes, and now we can see you. Okay. So I don't know if I'm still showing in other places. I have like two laptops that for some reason I can't connect to Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> I have like three different Wi-Fi options, but okay, I'm on my phone. All right, it's working. So am I introducing myself or am I answering yes. a question? We're in, we're in intro mode still. <laughs> intro mode, okay. I am Tiffany DuVernay Smith, and uh, <clears throat> I will say that I believe in breaking pattern cycles and chains, footholds, strongholds, and chokeholds. I'm very happy to be here today. I am a systems reform advocate with lived experience and, you know, domestic violence, unfortunately. And like I said, I'm really happy to be speaking with you here. Um, <clears throat> I have been able to survive um, narcissistic abuse and walk away from it and learn from it and grow from it and recognize it. Um, so just the trauma involved in that, there's the mental health component, depression, anxiety, PTSD that came along with it. This was 2012 when I walked away. Also homelessness that came with that, also law enforcement contact. So I'm happy to be bringing my lived experience here. This has uh, transformed me into an advocate speaking on a city, county, state and federal level. And um, has led me to do a lot, lots of consulting and symposiums and webinars and workshops and press conferences <laughs> and um, serving in advisory roles and community action boards, advisory councils, advisory groups and advisory boards. And then all of my lived experience plus my uh, corporate America background has me in the position where I'm at now as the advisory group coordinator for LASA's lived experience advisory board. So that's my professional role. But today I'm here speaking to you through my lived experience voice as a systems reform advocate. Thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. So um, along with many other experts in the space, we've brought together a toolkit of how to form, create, fund, operate supportive housing with trauma survivors uh, at the forefront. And uh, I'll drop in the chat the link to the toolkit and a number of, of deep dive webinar sessions we've done on it and various uh, chapters. But here's an overview of some of the chapters um, that we'll be lifting up more in our session today. Um, and so lots, lots to grab in the toolkit. Uh, for some, you might just want to grab one of these chapters because it's more relevant to you. And so it's intended as a holistic guide or as a what you're most interested in guide. And it's brought together, we'll explain the methodology more um, by uh, people who live in supportive housing, housing developers, people who operate the services, uh, service providers and architects and excited to lift up their expertise and uh, these were the primary authors and major contributors to the toolkit, these fantastic organizations from across the nation, um, and of course, survivors themselves. So thank you again for joining and Saba, I'll hand it over to you to kick off our content. Wonderful, thank you so much, Amy, for um, doing an overview of our wonderful toolkit that we are just so delighted to share with you more about today, um, which, which is, as we know, is, um, focused on permanent supportive housing for survivors of domestic violence um, to improve survivors access to and outcomes in permanent supportive housing across the country. And so I wanna start with Amy and Chris um, to, to sort of give us uh, a little bit, tell us a little bit about 
um, what this toolkit is, and not only that, how it came to be. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, Downtown Women's Center has been a provider of supportive housing since the 80s, and perhaps we weren't calling it supportive housing, but we opened up a building for 48 women, and we still own and operate that building um, uh, as a supportive housing, permanent supportive housing model. And a majority of the uh, residents have survived domestic violence. Uh, we do our own community-based research through a women's needs assessment. The last one demonstrated 53% of the respondents said that they had experienced domestic violence uh, over the course of their lifetime. Um, of course, we know the populations that we serve in supportive housing are, uh, many are survivors of trauma. Alongside that, we formulated with a domestic violence program in Los Angeles Rainbow Services, what we now call the Domestic Violence Homeless Services Coalition, um, an effort now grown to 150 organizations, over nearly 500 people in Los Angeles working to decrease silos among domestic violence and homeless services organizations and increase housing resources for that population. So this toolkit really came out of conversations that DWC has been hosting for many years and out of the coalition, the Domestic Violence Homeless Services Coalition's conversations to make sure that we're building out a full continuum of housing resources for survivors. And I know Chris knows this so well from all of her work across the nation. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Definitely, um, we know that guidance and roadmaps and examples are just so helpful to the field right now. Because on the national level over the last 10 years, we've seen a huge expansion in the number of communities that are implementing a broader range of housing options and housing models and strategies. Um, survivors housing needs we know are, are really on a continuum. Um, based on their specific safety needs and their family composition and the circumstances they're in. Um, so we need to have a whole continuum of housing options. And these include the usual emergency and transitional housing that we've had in place for some time as a field, but uh, of course more permanent housing options and strategies like domestic violence housing first, rapid rehousing, flex funding, mobile advocacy, housing navigation and retention services have been added to that um, constellation of services in, a, in a, a big way in the last 10 years. But even with this really exciting shift in the field, communities have been slower to embrace permanent supportive housing um, and specifically for survivors. And we think there are several reasons for that. Um, on the victim services side, um, programs are newer to housing and may find the housing development process in particular pretty daunting. And on the homeless and housing side, the idea of providing victim specific services is kind of new territory, new-ish <laughs> territory, especially if they're backed by HUD funding, which um, typically requires eligibility for PSH um, that's based on chronic homelessness um, and a disabling uh, condition. And that may not be the circumstances of, of uh, the, the particular vulnerabilities that survivors face and sometimes closes that option off to the survivor population. So we really developed the content of this toolkit um, to help demystify both uh, the development aspects and the programmatic aspects of domestic violence uh, specific uh, permanent supportive housing and to amplify the themes and the needs uh, that have been identified by LA's, as Amy was um, mentioning earlier, the DV and Homeless Services Coalition. They've got it going on. <laughs> um, and we also really wanna bring front and center uh, what survivors themselves are telling us um, that they need. Um, and Amy presented the toolkit overview earlier in the session. I just wanna pull out some of the broad topics we believe are so important to consider. One is how to bring in a trauma-informed approach, um, not only to services, but to building design itself. Um, considerations around serving survivors of color and survivors with other intersectional identities needs to be very primary. Avenues for keeping survivors at the center before, during, and after developing the site, not a one and done, um, and its services through ongoing partnership with survivors. 
and then a cultivation of strategic partnerships and community support in uh, PSH development and the identification of key funding sources. And then also a look at property management, considerations around how to ensure responsive and effective property management, as well as information on leasing policies, um, legal housing protections and safety, security and confidentiality issues. Amy? Just hoping that even though we're focusing on domestic violence survivors, what we mean in doing so is trying to create the best environment for all. This is a toolkit that can be used for all supportive housing, regardless of what population is being supported in the program. And that perhaps by using these methods, we're, became, we're creating a sort of universal way to operate supportive housing. Sab, I'll hand it back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much for um, giving us a real comprehensive view of um, what's available in the toolkit, understanding that permanent supportive housing really requires a village um, of, of different practitioners, you know, providers, um, as well as development and, um, of course, uh, community. And that, you know, it, it was really rooted, uh, that the, our process in developing this toolkit was rooted in uh, the voices of people with those experiences, uh, intersectional experiences of domestic violence and homelessness. And so now I'd, I'd like to, um, you know, kind of take us into our sort of current moment um, with that, that little thing called the pandemic um and sort of thinking about how where we're standing now and um the fallout with social isolation and the economic fallout of course um resulting in spikes in domestic violence as we've we've understood um still waiting for more of that data um as well as, of course, we know increasing unemployment and housing insecurity, especially in the face of the expired eviction moratorium, all of which have people urgently thinking about housing and, and seeking housing. Um, but this toolkit tells us that housing has always been integral to personal stability uh, and especially to the process of healing, of healing trauma for survivors and other vulnerable, vulnerable populations. So I'd like to uh, address this one to Tiffany. If you could share with us why that is, why is it that um, uh, housing and housing stability is so integral to healing? So will you confirm that my connection is okay now? Okay, great. So, so stability and healing. So, so first I just have to say how just breathing in my own place is healing, <laughs> was healing, right? Just. Oh my gosh, this, so the who am I, where am I, what on earth is going on with me was able to come to a stop. Then there's the who am I, where am I, and now what am I going to be and do with the rest of my life, <laughs> you know? And then there's the moment where it's like, okay, baby steps, right? And I just think it's important to remember how, how primal housing is, right? We think of food, clothing, and shelter as being so necessary, but we didn't think of that shelter as a tent, whoever laid out this slogan that's been around for a long time, food, clothing, and shelter, food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, what kind of shelter are you talking about? So housing is of the utmost importance. I mean, who can heal from any experience laying on the sidewalk? 
for a bench for staying awake all night so they can feel safe to sleep during the day in the cut somewhere. Um, being in the, the wind and the rain, being outside is, um, I mean, where I'm going with this is just the emotional safety, that factor and being in your own place, emotional safety comes along with that. And um, relaxation and comfort. And, you know, I have to say that um, I, I, I'm one of those people who lo I lost a part-time job. Um, right away because of COVID. I was working with elementary kids. So, you know, the schools were shut down. And um, I just cannot imagine. I loved when my abuser left home. I left in 2012, right? I love when my abuser left home. <laughs> Trying to boss me around the whole time he was gone, but I still enjoyed my freedom. I cannot imagine right now being in an abu abusive situation with nowhere to go other than with your abuser i had to do that i had to go back to my abuser willing to take me with open arms because i was experiencing homelessness and so willing to take me into his parents garage without them knowing just so that i wouldn't be on the street And then when I, when I left him, I left into homelessness. Homelessness was a part of that relationship. And then when I left him, I, I, didn't, I didn't have anywhere to go. I had a married couple saying, stay here. But you know, does a married couple really want <laughs> me to be intrusive, you know? So, you know, I, part of my, my journey is gonna come out, you know, during this conversation, but personal stability Of course, it's connected to healing. <laughs> you don't need me to explain it. Can you imagine not being stable? So for example, I'm going through something right now. And thank God I was able to sleep in a hotel last night. I get to get on a plane and, and, go, and go home. You know, I moved on from permanent supportive housing and I, I am in a low income housing, but I'm still housed. I couldn't imagine the things that I'm going through right now and also being unhoused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's the peace that a person is going to feel. It's the love that a person feels. It's the justice that a person feels that somebody saw me as a person and, and helped me. It's the answered prayer of it all. You can only cry and beg so much for God to even think about you. Mm -hmm. And we, this is the Housing California Conference. For some people, it's a job. For other people, you are, you are the answer prayer. And this might not even be spiritual work for you, but guess what? You are still the answer prayer. Mm. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I mean, clearly, um, just the images that you bring, you bring up about being on the street, being on a bench, not being able to sleep at night uh, because you you worry for your safety. Clearly, if one is in that mode of fight, flight, or freeze, there's no opportunity for your body to settle enough to to feel safe enough to start to heal those wounds. So um, it's just really powerful to say that because I know a lot of people in this conference understand that, but we have to sort of keep that very close to us in recognizing that um, the medicinal aspect of, of, of housing. And of course, um, 
the, the inherent human right. So thank you so much. And I think, you know, the, the toolkit was really meant to center um, the perspectives of the experiences of the people that have the experiences um, of, of domestic violence at, at the intersection of homelessness. And, and you know, because we need to acknowledge um, that our developers, housing developers and service providers really have to understand that and, and really have to be continuously listening and um, taking feedback and then implementing that feedback. Um, and so I just wanted to circle back to Amy and Chris to speak a little bit more about the process of, of how the information and recommendations in this toolkit were gathered, which I, I know had a great deal to do with that listening and that you know coming back and iteratively working together to develop um, something really valuable so that other, other people may learn and how to do that with their own communities. So I'll start with um, Chris, please. Thank you, Saba, and thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, and pretty much everything I'm gonna say is gonna just underline what you put out there <laughs> from your own experience. Um, we, we looked um, we, at the literature, we looked at what research has been done on permanent supportive housing, specifically with um, a, a survivor um, lens. And most of that research was grounded in just talking to survivors and, and asking them about their experiences. Um, there's not much out there yet because this model is, is still um, kind of in the nascent stages, but what we did find really um, just said kind of the same things that Tiffany just shared with us. And, and one is uh, one theme that, that it really lifts up a lot was that having permanent supportive housing, survivors definitely agreed that how, having permanent supportive housing was very foundational to their healing process. Um, and it helped them feel safe. Um, and that when survivors didn't have to worry about their immediate housing and their safety needs, they were more likely to begin to be able to address the full range of trauma impacts and, and other issues that they, they needed to look at, um, often for the very first time um, when they could breathe in their own space, as Tiffany was sharing with us. Um, and th they also found that survivors really wanted to be involved in the design and the development and, and have a voice and really be central to what the program would look like. So these themes um, and the themes that Tiffany spoke to were also validated by survivors that um, this project heard from in December, 2019, when Dr. Shanti Kalkarni and my former uh, SHA colleague, Suzanne Marcus, conducted a listening session in LA. The survivors who participated were all currently living in PSH or other subsidized housing. And the first thing that jumped up and jumped out as they shared their experiences was just how fragile their situations still were, even while living in stable housing. Many talked about uh, feeling housed and abandoned um, when services that would really speak to and address their needs were just not provided as part of the program. Um, and that theme also emerged in the literature review um, and suggests that uh, domestic violence specific permanent supportive housing services should be offered, um, voluntary services offered on site and, and off site. And that um, there was a focus on um, in the survivors' comments on the need for help with practical skills like job search, financial counseling, um, and also supports, uh, concrete supports like transportation, childcare, and medical and legal services. So those were really critical to survivors not feeling housed and abandoned. Um, so there's a whole lot that still needs to be attended to once housing is achieved. Um, and that's the time when those intensive services and support can be the most effective for survivors. Um, they're, they're available to them. Um, at that point because they're, they're feeling safe and, and housed. Another strong theme from the listening session was that um, survivors face real challenges to building economic stability. 
while also maintaining Section 8 and other subsidized housing, health care, and other entitlements. One survivor said, you're telling your Section 8 worker what you're making, and they're raising your rent higher and higher and higher, you know, and that gets very stressful. Um, and then I get told, well, if you didn't work, you wouldn't have an issue. <laughs> I don't have the choice. I have to work. I have the disability. Yeah, but I still have to work. I have to pay bills. I have to pay rent. I have to pay lights and gas. Um, a third theme that the listening sessions lifted up was around how the ongoing stress of finding and keeping housing really triggers physical and mental health issues that are connected to extensive histories of, of uh, violent, domestic violence and homelessness. And a fourth and final theme was that survivors um, need PSH that is specifically designed for their unique needs so that um, uh, survivor lens infused throughout the program and what it looks like um, was huge. Um, one said uh, PSH is a blessing, but then it can also be a nightmare. And it's very re-traumatizing to live where I have a person on top of me that's on drugs, that drops a bowling ball in the middle of the night because he's tweaking. And then my neighbor thinks it's me, bangs on my wall, and I think it's an earthquake and I'm traumatized. Um, all these experiences shared by survivors um, and, and the messages that they tell, that they give us, um, were really central to the design of the toolkit. Amy? After we had the survivor focus group, we had a, a national call, uh, basically a focus group among architects, service providers, and housing developers in this space um, who, again, work across this nation. And a lot of themes were lifted up, challenges and, and things that work well in support of housing. So we uh, dove deep into other chapters around themes of how survivors access permanent supportive housing, especially if they're coming through a victim service provider or domestic violence organization that may or may not be connected to the coordinated entry, which for the most part is the main way people enter permanent supportive housing. So where are we actually blocking survivors from accessing this needed housing resource and, and ways um, we spotlighted some ways in Los Angeles that we're, we're uh, aligning the system so that survivors are not blocked from coordinated entry. Uh, we talked a lot about how to really implement trauma-informed care program design and trauma-informed architectural design and how to lift up the voice of residents and survivors to make sure that we're doing that well. We talked a lot about safety and confidentiality, both in the physical design of a space but in, even in the beginning process, every you know, low-income housing development is a very public process. So how are we talking about who will live in the space in a city planning meeting or at city council meetings? And how are we uh, bringing dignity to the people that will live there, but also creating safety in their community when everything is so publicly documented? Uh, we grappled a lot with mixed populations within low-income housing. Um, and how to serve everyone well, and how to make everyone feel safe. Um, we grappled a lot with what can be shared among property managers and service providers, and where is that line of confidentiality, and where, you know, where, how we can best work together in a trauma-informed way. Um, all the ways, and again, this is trauma-informed design, but all the ways to infuse client and resident choice, even from uh, how they could influence the design of the space, how um, they can choose the furniture and the furnishings uh, within the space, how they can feel most welcomed in the space. So these are really rich conversations that, that um, of course, got lifted up into um, lots of highlights and spotlights and, and more content in the toolkit. And this was really important to us in Los Angeles. You've perhaps been following a, a new funding measure called Prop HHH and Saba, I know you've done a lot of work in this space and I'm curious about as these insights have come to light when we went out and did these focus groups, wrote the toolkit, you know, what are some of your main takeaways, uh, especially, you know, thinking through a service provider lens and a housing development um, lens um, and uh, 
you know, what are some of your main takeaways and how this toolkit can address um, housing, like how housing developers really do this well for survivors. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. I really, um, you know, I really appreciate what both you and Chris have really made clear that we have to do better in the context of permanent supportive housing for DV survivors, um, that we don't have enough understanding around their particular needs. Uh, I think I think what is a very nascent but um, emerging field on the development side is, is partnering with um, architects to develop trauma-informed space, spaces um, based on the needs and identities of the, the people that will be inhabiting those spaces. So we know confidentiality is a really important piece uh, because survivors may still be um, um, sort of needing that very visceral protection um, from their abusers. Uh, and so there are a number of, of architects and um, developers that are looking at this issue and really taking a deep focus on what it means to have trauma-informed spaces. Um, in fact, in our work together uh, in, in sort of rolling out this toolkit with the, with the wonderful webinars that we did uh, just after the release, we got to learn about some excellent work happening in Denver uh, with uh, Shop Works. And uh, Laura Rossbert was able to be on our panel to talk about the research that they've done around um, engaging people with lived experiences of homelessness to co-design these these spaces in which they will call home. And I remember um, one story that she told was about uh, the bathrooms and how for trans individuals, bathrooms had a, were a trigger um, potentially. And so they really went in on the bathroom and created this beautiful, these beautiful spaces for people to, to um, feel safe, to feel loved, um, light and nature. I know there's another developer or architect that works uh, with developers here in Los Angeles called Ali Barar. And he's at uh, GAA Plus Architects. And um, just in the context of, of the Supportive Housing Institute, which was um, a great training that I had the opportunity to, to deliver uh, in Los Angeles County, how he shared one development that was just sort of like nestled in the heart of nature. They were really using nature to like bring in uh, sun, light, greenery uh, to people in the spaces that they, in the, in the development that they were creating so that people could find solace um, and uh, healing in the context of nature. So those are just a couple of examples. I just wanna lift up that actually tomorrow, there's going to be a SCAMP panel on radical hospitality, research and best practices and trauma-informed design. So I wanna plug that uh, for anyone, any developers and architects that are interested in, in kind of hearing more from people. And in fact, the two people I lifted up <laughs> are gonna be on that panel um, to really get this movement going because really we can, we can practice trauma-informed care in architecture, in management, in self-care, like there, there is no limit to which we can practice the principles of trauma-informed care. And um, I just wanna shift uh, now to, to thinking again, more specifically about survivors. Um, and um, what did the process behind this toolkit zero in on in terms of the main areas for improvement with how, how we do our work? And I'll guess I'll start with Amy. Yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've been in this work for 20 years and that focus group among the survivors was um, heart wrenching to hear, even in some of our best supportive housing programs, how we're not meeting the needs. Um, and to just, it just really drilled home to listen to the expressed needs um, one that just keeps emerging, Tiffany lifted up this like, 
we want people to heal and progress and move, yet we, um, the benefits cliff when someone gets a job, what, what the time period of what gets lost when what gets gained. And to really help people, we've been partnering with an organization called Free From that really helps with economic uh, wealth building opportunities uh, as people progress in that space. Really just the property management side, the constant threat of eviction, whether real or you know, perceived or real, um, and how property management can, can be done through a trauma-informed lens. Um, we've you know, said a lot about architecture, um, but really working with those architects uh, and design. And they want, like every architect that I've worked with is just wants that feedback in that space with the residents. So giving safe access to people who live in supportive housing so they can really inform the design or just, you know, some things that I just are now completely seared in my brain, especially as like I'm involved in now six new uh, supportive housing projects. And I just have their voices every time I go into a meeting about those. And I'll just add to that, that um, the, these clusters of barriers that survivors often face um, have been captured really well by Dr. Shanti Kolkarni in um, a paper that she wrote uh, called the, How the Cycle of Housing Insecurity. And they're almost kind of predictable um, barriers and challenges that survivors are going to face if the services that they need aren't in place. Um, and so really this toolkit was designed to, to zero in on um, what to do so that survivors do not feel housed and abandoned um, and, and how they can increase their economic security and support and, and get support for their, their mental and physical health needs um, while they're in housing. Excellent. Thank you for lifting up Dr. Dr. Kulkarni's uh, research. And again, invite people to look at, at the website, uh, DWC website, where we where she um, was one, on one of our webinars that was like really, you know, like I mentioned earlier, where we lifted up and we when we first released toolkit. So I want us to dig even more deeply um, and around the main survivor needs and experiences. Um, so, so I'm turning this to, to Tiffany. What, you know, what are those main survivor needs and experiences um, that are necessary to thrive and heal in permanent supportive housing? Um, just for clarity. The necessary support to thrive that's the question right so um before i just answer the question i'm just gonna say my experience okay so i was on a healing journey so i had um my my it was dpss department of public social services that referred me to a domestic violence clinic where i received services for five and a half years it was 90 days in where I had the strength to leave my abuser for good. So I would, I would list DPSS where I went for cash and food stamps as support because they had it to where I didn't have to come off for three months, like on for nine months and off for three months. They let me stay and keep my benefits under like a mental health component that's called like need special assistance. So as long as I was going for my DV services, which I really, really needed. So my healing journey looked like going to a depression therapist that I was referred to by my primary care physician for 12 sessions, then being referred to 40 sessions of PTSD therapy um, with a somebody who specialized in that, and then off to a group, <laughs> a support group, learning the same thing, which was actually seeking safety. Um, that healing also looked like me getting certified to do seeking safety with other people, whether a group or individual. 
and doing that twice as a refresher. It led me to learn about emotional CPR. Go ahead and look that up, eCPR. That has to do with being, I, I, I could only describe it my way, right? It has to do with being with a person. So imagine being able to resuscitate somebody's heart. Remember we talked about emotional safety, but in an emotional way. And so it's not hurry up, shut up. Anybody got time for that? It's I'm here, I'm with you, I see you, I feel you. The purpose of that is when that person walks away and they're experiencing whatever they're experiencing, they, they don't feel alone because that person was with them in that moment. And if that can be repeated over and over, it would be beautiful. Um, I went after mental health first aid certification, the DV 40 hour training twice, and um, CBT a couple of times, that's the cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy a couple of times, lots of group therapy, lots of, I started advocating while I was homeless and finding my voice and I did a lot of walking and hitting the pavement. I did a lot of bus riding going clear across town. Okay. So why couldn't it be with me in my building? A well-known provider that has almost 50 apartment complexes across LA. Surely they can provide support. Yes, they have case management on site. But was that case manager supportive? No, because when I was completely ready for my moving on voucher, she blocked me. My problem is that you may be the gatekeeper, the gatekeeper, but look at me. It ain't your money. Quit blocking people. It ain't your money. So I had to check her when Measure H came around. Okay, as a Lyft driver, everybody heard about Measure H and so did this case manager. And she decided to let me know, I don't live in LA. Nah, 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 nah. And she has to drive clear from, I don't know, Rancho Cucamonga, wherever she was coming from, to come to the hood, Western and 39th Street. Okay, to tell me she can't vote for Measure H. Oh yes, you can, because it's a county measure. And if you vote for one thing, vote for that. So that's when I learned that this, um, you know, I'm not racist or anything, but I learned that this white woman is coming over here with her dog and refusing to help. So I waited for the next person to come and moved on with my life. I stayed there four and a half years. I didn't have to. I learned how to take care of myself. I learned how to be stable. And then I got blocked by a control freak. So all you power and control freaks sitting at the gate, not really helping people, hold them back on deposits, hold them back on furniture, hold them back on helping somebody. <laughs> You're all the way wrong, dead wrong. So I, I, I also wanted to say something to what Chris said, this whole sink or swim concept. Where does that come from? What do you mean sink or swim? Here's your housing buy. No, can't treat, can't treat people that way. And then with the benefits and income limits. So I was paying $52 a month. Do you know how freeing it was for me to learn that I can make $25,000, 500 a month and not get kicked out? Yes, I would, my portion would go up, fine. But do you know how traumatizing the recertification process is? Because somebody has the power to say, go back to the street. I have to turn in recertification paperwork as soon as I get back. Let me tell you something. Y'all know what big girl panties are? I put my big girl panties on and filed my taxes for the first time since 2006. I was unemployed for 12 and a half years. Scared to report somebody gave me a dollar. You understand what I'm telling you? So now I, I, I just file taxes and I get to turn it into my apartment building and hope they don't put me out. <laughs> um, support is very necessary. Listening is very necessary. 
no victim blaming allowed. You didn't get raped because your jeans were tight. It's not your fault. No minimizing. You know, I prefer love and I prefer hugs. So this blocking survivors and locking them out of coordinated entry, I think, I think the system compartmentalizes too much. A person is a person is a person is a person is a human is a human is a human is a human is a human. And let me tell you something, in case you didn't know, racism has nothing to do with the white man. It is the evil spirit of hatred. So we can stop compartmentalizing where racism came from too. If you're racist, it ain't even you. It's the evil spirit of hatred working through you and you need to do something and stop allowing that type of spirit. Don't be a vessel for that type of energy. If we can all be about the purpose of love and justice, people would be having a completely different experience. And you got to take care of your case managers because the case managers are taking care of, uh, of, of people. So if you're not taking care of your case managers, if, if, if this case manager is making $20 an hour, you can leave somewhere else and go make 25 or 27. <laughs> sure, 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 people are going to jump, sh jump shit. Somebody told me today, McDonald's is paying $21 an hour and their employer is paying less. So yeah, there's a high turnover. McDonald's is paying $21 an hour. You know, you want to be the fry guy for $21 an hour. So um, it, it really is this whole, all of this work is only going to be effective one way. Nothing about us without us. How dare you think you know anything without consulting a person who's been there, done that, and knows how it could be better based on their experience and the experience of their other people that they're engaging with who are experiencing homelessness. So I think um, a lot of humility is in order. I think a lot of um, consulting people is in order. I think a lot of um, looking at people through a different lens. You know, I have a corporate America background. I was a full grown 36 year old adult, very independent, strong black woman when I hit the streets of homelessness. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Uh, so it would have been helpful to me for my services to be closer. It would have been helpful to me to have a, a, come on, your whole apartment is full of trauma survivors. Why isn't there just a therapist there? Just period. Like, why not? How many people are getting their hours? And this is a reason for turnover, isn't it? I'm only here to do my hours. And as soon as I'm done, bye, hire somebody else. All right, what about the incentives to stay? Don't, don't teachers, don't students get incentives like don't take care of your whole tuition if you come and serve right here in the ghetto for a few years? Can't you do something like that with case managers? We don't want a high turnover. You can stay here and do your hours and then we need, also need a commitment from you after. Don't bounce. That's not, a, that's not representative of love and justice for the person who actually needs it. If we're talking about healing, healing, my healing also came from the consistency of the people who were, are <laughs> supportive to me. I don't know what love is unless you love me. If you don't love me, how do I know what it is? You got to know people are broken. Broken. Because a lot of times it's, uh, of course, our decisions lead us to places. 
and then sometimes it's other it's it's whatever circumstances and sometimes it's other people creating these traumatic interactions and experiences that we have it would be nice to for someone experiencing homelessness and someone experiencing permanent supportive housing to have a, the a, the supportive stability if that's someone that says i'm in there i'm not going anywhere not only is this my job but it's my heart thank you You put it all so, you said so much and you, you touched on so many intersections, Tiffany. And I just wanna thank you for sharing your personal experiences and kind of speaking to so many audiences directly, service providers, um, the, the system. Um, and I, I do, I do wanna zoom in on what you, started to talk about with regards to race. I'm really happy that you brought that up because I think that piece is, is really insidious. And I think it's sort of, it's also very under-examined. Um, and so I, I want to encourage providers to think about culturally specific approaches to healing, creating racially affirming spaces that um, where knowing that the disproportionate number of people experiencing homelessness are people of color and that we have a foundation of policies within our nation that has systemically marginalized those people um, over hundreds of years. And so given that we understand the disproportion that disproportionate representation of people of color exists in every single state, in our nation, that we have to work within our own bodies to understand our own biases and really bring that into the way that we're providing trauma-informed care. So racially conscious trauma-informed care and really bringing that into the conversation um, when you are caring for as, as a provider, as a service provider. Uh, and, um, Dr. Wendy Ashley here in, in Los Angeles has, has been doing some really excellent work with our COC um, to sort of to lift that up for providers. And I'm happy that we're, we're calling that out in the toolkit. Also uh, the members of, of my community at the Homelessness Policy Research Institute just released a really excellent paper and research um, on trauma-informed uh, approaches and how that intersects with homelessness. So I really re invite people to take a look at that and I'll pop it in the chat. And um, we only have a, a few minutes, but I am going to turn it over to, to Chris. Thanks, Saba. Yeah, we knew this time was gonna go really fast, didn't we? <laughs> so um, I think we have, and, and everything that you and Tiffany just shared is so powerful. It's, it's just really important for us to acknowledge the structural racism, how it shows up in, in myriad ways in our own institutions, in our own fields, um, and that we have to really pay attention to that in all its aspects um, and move beyond talk um, we've been talking about it for a long time, putting it into action. So thank you for, for all that. Um, in, in our remaining time, let's just uh, explore a little bit more fully the idea of survivor voice and inclusion in uh, permanent supportive housing, which the toolkit really emphasizes that point. Centering survivors shouldn't just happen in service provision. It needs to be an ongoing process um, throughout the PSH development. Um, and operation cycle. And so Saba, I'm, I'm wondering if you can um, tell us a bit about what PSH development looks like and where survivor voice can really um, stand to be amplified <laughs> and how that can improve the process. I think it's really vital throughout the, the sort of five stages of development, be, beginning at the very nascent stage of concept all the way to operations that survivors are involved. Um, and, and not just cursorily, but 
partnered with very intently in an iterative co-creative process. So I think about the, the concept of social innovation, which really stipulates that uh, co-production and iteration to really walk hand in hand to say, is this, is this the, the, the thing that's going to meet your need? And then to test that iteratively along the way so that you're really not um, veering out of, of the path of the needs of the people that are going to call this place home. Um, and and so I I I know that you know there is some work being done that uh, architects are starting to do that work, but I think we need to have that be um, a baseline, and and really formalize those processes so that we have it built into the way that we even conceptualize the beginning of of any permanent supportive housing. Um, and I think it's also really vital for us to take a, a racially and um, to think about marginalized identities and intersectional marginalized identities um, and how that has, you know, developers have a responsibility to remedy some of that historic harm, racialized harm. That uh, that I did, you know, we didn't get a chance to go into depth with, but thinking about our policies, thinking about the real estate system and and redlining and how affordable housing can really respond to that. So inviting people to really be intentional and conscious about what is the history in my region around what is the race history here, what you know, what, how can I be a part of that change and think about your work as as social and racial justice work. Um, so yeah, I think th there isn't, you know, we can we really could go in in, in great depth around the intersection of, of marginalized identities and, and staying close to each other as we develop new, new permanent supportive housing. And I think we may be coming up now um, against our QA. <laughs> Oh, Chris, you're muted. I was unmuting and I was muting, sorry. Um, uh, I wonder if, if um, Amy could just speak to um, the resident advisory board as an example yeah. of what Downtown Women's Center is, is doing around mm -hmm. that. And Tiffany, if you have a, a few words to say about what kind of training and support those folks need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Tiffany's a real expert here. Uh, we do have a, a committee of our governing board of directors so we have a uh, board of directors sitting with uh, participants of Downtown Women's Center and residents um, and a formalized process, happy to share our charter and, and how we go about that. But um, we do things like review architectural design together or review new programs that we're embarking on or new um, housing models. We're talking a lot with residents right now about master leasing potentials, uh, just really talking about everything so that we, um, go into it with a co-design process and with their express needs lifted up everywhere we go. Uh, but this is Tiffany's work now and I want to hear from you. Okay. <laughs> I, um, I have a couple of questions going around in my mind. So I do want to say something about NIMBYism and that, um, you know, we need more people to be welcoming. <laughs> welcoming of trauma survivors. And uh, I appreciate you, Saba, about being racially conscious, even through this trauma-informed care lens. Um, so, First and foremost, I remember speaking about item number five <laughs> at a city meeting that has to do with people with lived experience being on a commission for homelessness. And there was a speaker, I don't remember what he said verbatim, but I know it was like, like, how can these people be on a commission? Like, really? So of course, <laughs> 
I just, at the end of what I came there to say, I had to say something that has really stuck with me. Um, I'm ready, able, willing, and capable. And so are other people. And so I, I say that when I promote uh, LASA's Lived Experience Advisory Board, they are ready, willing, able, and capable to participate at every level. The design, the implementation, the monitoring, the evaluating, all of that. I, my, my, uh, it's not even a fight because lots of staff seems to be so willing. So I'm really appreciative, appreciative of the legislative and policy team for coming in at the ground level. This was about a month ago, not bringing a draft of a policy, but getting their input on the draft. That's cutting edge to now, okay, so now this is the engagement to get in on the ground level of every policy being drafted and then coming back. This is the draft according to the feedback from the advisory board and from the staff. And now where do we go with the draft? You know, but that inclusion is very, uh, it's very telling that you know that the success is gonna come from these voices. Um, the person with lived experience gets a chance to not be a checkbox because um, the vision and the suggestion are infused in the policy that are infused in the programs that are being ran that eventually affect the end user. So if that evil spirit of hatredism is really behind the racism that is leading to all these intersectionalities that lead to homelessness, then you gotta know love and justice is the only way to combat the evil period of hatred driving racism. And if the love and justice in the person who, as, who is surviving and thriving, so me, I want the love and justice infused into the policy. I'm aiming for that advisory board to infuse their experience, which is also infused with love and justice into the policy, into the programs, into the person on the street, waiting on that answered prayer to feel love and justice. This is the circle, this is the cycle. This is, the, this is what I see. How do you support? You support with love and justice too. <laughs> what do you need? How can I help you? This is what's going to happen. You know, it's, it's being informative. It's my best experience is somebody at Downtown Women's Center. It, Anita, the best prep person ever for a presentation. Oh, listening to me, taking notes from me. Okay, according to what you said, these are your talking points following up with me, just a very easygoing experience that has empowered me to be the same for the next person and to be with them as they're preparing that they totally feel my love and my support. As I stand by them and with them and advocate them to get their voices heard, feedback to internal staff and system partners to pave the way and knock down every door until it is yes. Our first panelist, I think I put a T on yes, huh? Our first uh, moderator was Supervisor Holly Mitchell, and I learned something from her. I'm going to make sure the answer is yes. That empowered me. Thank you, Holly Mitchell, wherever you are. Yes. My role in the Lit Experience Advisory Board that I'm responsible for with LASA is for them to make the answer yes, not blocked. <laughs> yes. What a perfect way to end our session with the answer of yes through love and justice. Tiffany, thank you. Saba, thank you. Chris, thank you. Thank you for your colleagueship, your partnership in this work as we have um, brought this toolkit together and we're continuing to evangelize it um, <laughs> wherever we can. So thank you Housing California for having us too and for everyone who came today. Thank you everyone. Appreciate, well, appreciate you, you. Thank you everyone and especially to my favorite panel. Welcome Chris, 
happy to be presenting <laughs> with this presentation for a third time. I love our chemistry and so do others. And I'm grateful to be <laughs> presenting again. Thank you. Thank you. Wish we were together. Glad many, many of you are. Bye. <laughs>